and welcome to Hakuoki Stories of the Shisungumi. This is a uh, visual novel style game where it's purely story driven and uh, with that it means, uh, what am I looking for, speed, throw that up. Wasn't there? Um, what am I looking for? What am I looking for? What am I looking for? Ah, there we go. I'll play speed up. Um, anyways, this is man, where it's going to be really difficult. I'm not going to read the main character's voice. I don't have any sort of established female range, so it's just not going to happen. I will, however, read the narrator, because I don't really have entirely much else to do in a visual novel style game. So, let's see, uh... At least one of the stories of what happened in about the 1800s in Japan. Mid-1800s. It was awfully impressive, there was no denying it. Even the simplest hellos between people passing in the street seemed warm and friendly. They nodded and smiled to one another, almost as if they were family, not strangers about on errands. Still, there was something else as well, something that made the city feel strangely cold, almost as though there was a great invisible wall shutting out anyone who wandered in from the country. It wasn't particularly comfortable, I had to admit. Now I'm going to replace eyes with she. How's that? Is that better? She had walked quite some distance to reach Kyoto, and it occurred to me, to her, that her mind and body were both very tired. Even so, tiredness was no reason for her to stand about feeling sorry for herself. She couldn't afford to, after all. With new, albeit forced, resolved, she tried to stop a passerby. She was lost again, but in a different sort of way. She sighed and found herself looking up at the darkening sky. The sun was beginning to set. The people she'd spoken to hadn't been unkind. They'd given her the direction she'd needed, but... Apart from her father, there was only one other person in the city who she could rely on, Dr. Matsumoto. Dr. Matsumoto was a doctor in service to the Shogunate. She had never met her, him herself, but her father had put a great deal of trust in the man. He had told her that if she should run into any trouble during his absence, she was to contact Dr. Matsumoto. Unfortunately, Dr. Matsumoto was apparently out of town on business and would not return for some time. True, it is rather rude to visit unannounced, which was why she hadn't sent a letter ahead of time. Of course, if he'd been gone for very long, then he had almost certainly not read her letter. Perhaps, she thought, she should have waited for a reply before traveling alone to a city she'd never even seen. No, 
She knew she could not have waited any longer. He paused for a moment and looked at her. He had been leaving the house often then, sometimes for days at a time. There was no hiding her disappointment. Nonetheless, she wasn't a child anymore, and couldn't beg him not to go or some other foolishness. Sure, she'd be lonely, but she was much more worried for him. He only smiled and nodded. Father kept his promise. A new letter arrived every day, and she scarcely had time to respond before another would arrive. He told her that he worried about her, home, all by herself. Then the letters stopped. A whole month passed with no word from her father, and she began to worry. They said Kyoto is a place full of ronin. It is not a safe place. Usually, a samurai is paid by their house. But a ronin with no house to report too often... Ah, ronin with no house report too often rob people in order to make ends meet. They're nothing more than violent criminals who hide behind the image of the samurai. Such is the state of the city of Kyoto, the city of Ronin. Small wonder, then, that she wonder, worried for her father's safety. Her mind would concoct horrible possibilities, and she inevitably found herself depressed and tense. Lost in thought, she hadn't noticed that night had already fallen. If she was honest with herself, she hadn't the first idea how long it might take to find her father. She'd taken some money with her, but it wasn't much. Enough to last her a month, if she used it wisely. If she could find her father in that time, so much the better. If not, hopefully Dr. Matsumoto would return before her funds ran out. Should she be able to find either of them, then it seemed she would be forced to return home. And so she lengthened her stride and set off down the street. Fortunately, men's clothing was much more conductive to such a pace than her usual dress would have been. She decided early on that Kyoto was far too dangerous for a girl from the country to explore alone, and that it would be wise for her to dress like a man, or at least a boy. Her disguise, such as it was, had proven successful and she'd made it all the way to Kyoto, unmolested. Perhaps that success had gone to her head, and let her think a girl dressed as a boy could explore Kyoto as she pleased. But, Kyoto is not a safe place. She should have remembered that. Instead, she had somehow convinced herself that whatever dangers in the city hid did not apply to her. Oi, that's the she was about to discover otherwise. She spun around. In the street in front of her were three men, running. She did her best to keep her voice calm as she reached in what she felt was a nonchalant way for her Kadachi. Her father had made her take lessons in self-defense. She'd kept with them and actually done rather well. Her skill was enough to defend against most attacks. Then again, Perhaps it was her confidence and her skill that had put her in this situation in the first place. 
She'd messed up and let her guard down. There was a chance she could take them on and win. But there were three of them, and one of her. Only then did she realize they were far more interested in her sword than they were in her. The sword wasn't just some blade she'd picked up. It had been passed down through her family for generations. There was no way she could have given it to the Ronin. Unfortunately, she had a feeling they wouldn't understand. In such a situation, the best decision was undoubtedly to retreat. And so she turned and ran as fast as her legs would carry. She felt like she'd been running for quite a while, but could still hear the Ronin behind her, cursing loudly. She ducked into an alley and flattened herself against the wall. After deciding they weren't too close, she crept farther into the alley. Someone had left a couple of sheets of wood leaning up against one of the houses. It was a perfect spot to hide. With luck, she thought as she knelt down to shuffle under them, this'll get her out of this mess. Something was wrong. She'd expected to hear the Ronin yelling to each other, looking for her. But seconds turned into minutes, and she heard nothing. She was about to sneak out and have a look, when... They began to scream. Her plan, was to, um, her plan to investigate was immediately halted. Remaining silent and hidden was clearly more important. Still. It was then that true fear began to set in. There was something out there. Something very, very dangerous. Something quite possibly lethal. The possibilities were... Well, her imagination conjured up no shortage of gruesome theories. Even so, she could feel that itch of curiosity. She wanted to know what was out there. Slowly, carefully, she edged up to the corner and looked out. Cold moonlight glared back at her from the bare blade of a drawn sword. Her eyes followed the blade up to the arm that held it, clad in a coat of light blue. Had this person saved her? But no sooner had it appeared that hope was dashed. <laughs> she could hear the Ronin beg for his life as he stumbled back. The person in the blue coat said nothing just stepped forward, his sword raised. <laughs> A high, screeching laugh cut through the man's scream. The blade fell through the air, more like a butcher's cleaver than a sword. No technique, no skill, just death. The scream turned suddenly wet, caught, and disappeared like air leaving a half, a half empty bellows. Her eyes went wide. She had just watched a murder. Whatever strength adrenaline had given her was suddenly gone. Her legs gave way and she crumpled to the ground. Her eyes had gone so wide, she thought they might never close. The Ronin had died with the first blow. But as she watched the blades kept falling, carving deep lines into the corpse. The soft slip of a blade through flesh, the crack as it struck bone, the silent creep of blood across ground. She felt nothing from them but madness. <laughs> 
Their only desire was raw, animal violence. Whatever they were, it wasn't human. They were broken. She could feel her throat closing up. She couldn't breathe. A warm, dark smell brushed against her face. It took her a moment to recognize the coppery tang of blood. An icy bolt of fear ran down her spine, crawling its way out into her limbs and freezing her in place. She was terrified. What was she going to do? What could she do? She forced her jaw open and drew a ragged breath. This was the only chance she'd get. She had... But her body, still numb with fear, was less than responsive. She lurched sideways, into the wood stacked against the building. With a rough clatter, it collapsed. The creatures turned, their blue coats drenched in blood. Hideous grins split their inhuman faces, and they shook with animal excitement at finding fresh prey to slaughter. She had to run. She couldn't die yet. But her legs refused to move. That hideous, cackling laughter began again. She was going to die. Her body was frozen with terror. Couldn't even scream. This was it. This was the end. She watched them raise their bloody swords, the moon glinting off the metal. Then there was a flash of light, and a soft splash of blood. She could feel it, warm and sticky. Bile began to rise on her throat, but before the disgust took hold, she heard a voice. <laughs> the words suggested disappointment, but the voice sounded happy. I think that's Okido, maybe? As he spoke, the strange man smiled, almost as if he were enjoying himself. He laughed. The man called Saito sighed with the air of a long-suffering companion, and looked over at her. His tone was light, but his words confirmed her fears. She had left the frying pan, yes but now was in the fire. Then, there was someone in charge of these two? The conversation seemed to suggest they were part of an organization of some sort. As she thought about it, she remembered hearing stories of a group of men with blue coats. Her thoughts were interrupted by a dark shape sliding into view. She swallowed hard. The moonlight shone off his smooth dark hair. For reasons she couldn't fathom, in that moment the light on his hair made her think of fluttery flower petals, almost as if the cherry trees were blooming out of season. His voice was cold and quiet, like a blade of ice. Blue-white moonlight lit his slender face and shone from the blade he held pointed at her chest. But it wasn't the sword that made her breath catch in her throat. It was his eyes. They were fierce and hard, but somewhere behind them she could catch a glimpse of something else. There could be no doubt that he was prepared to kill her, and yet he looked troubled. 
Not kindness, but perhaps mercy. She nodded. There was no doubt he'd meant every word he said. He stared at her for a moment, then grimaced, and with a sigh, put his sword away. She was too surprised to stop herself from speaking, and it quickly became apparent that she wasn't the only one. As he spoke to the man he'd called Hijikata, his eyes narrowed. The man called Hijikata frowned back at him. She wasn't quite sure what they'd meant, but it was clear enough that what she'd seen was something they'd wanted to keep hidden. Still, the more they said, the more she understood, despite the fact that none of us wanted such a thing. The way he looked at her made her feel as if she'd read her mind. Perhaps it would be best if she didn't think too hard about things when she wasn't supposed to think about it. The man they'd called Saito spoke with a quiet confidence. He glanced around, possibly looking for other witnesses, though he looked down at the creature he killed, almost as though he'd forgotten the whole ordeal. Mm -hmm. He peered down at the corpse, his face an emotionless mask. When he looked back up at his companions, however, his eyes narrowed. He was right. Even she had heard stories about a gang of cruel men in blue coats who cut people down in the streets. But. She did her best to be certain of herself, but it came out sounding more pleading than commanding. Her mind swirled with thoughts and worries. She was being drawn into their world. A world where there is nothing strange in carrying on a normal conversation in the dead of night with corpses for company. Well, I botched that one. Hijikata thought for a moment before he spoke. He gave a derisive bark That's not cool, I didn't know how to pronounce that word. He looked directly at her when he spoke, and she got the distinct feeling that his words weren't for his companions. It was common for people to be murdered in Kyoto. It was a dangerous city after all. She knew that, of course. But to see it happen? That was something else entirely. If death, will, uh, if death was such an easy thing in Kyoto, she thought, then the city itself must surely be mad. Ne, Tokoro desa. Taskete ageta no ni 
お礼の一つもないの She didn't realize immediately that he was speaking to her. When she did, her eyes went wide. Well, he did have a point. Despite their threats, they had saved her life. She stood up as steadily as she could manage, brushed some of the dirt off her clothes, and bowed. She glanced up at them, tentatively. The man called Saito was showing some confusion of his own. His eyes were out, his eyes were wide, and he had an expression she couldn't place. Hijikata looked as though he'd taken a bite of something sour. She looked up. Saito and Hijikata were both looking pointedly at anything but her. And the third man was shaking with laughter. Ah, go man, go man, so t h a t b o k a t a n d a m o n He broke out in laughter again, so much so that he was forced to wipe a few tears from his eyes as he straightened up. Do I t a s h m a s t e b o k a Okita s o j to him called it. l a g i t a r a s i k o a k i r a j a n a y o I knew that was okay though. Not quite sure what else to do. She bowed again. Whatever mirth she might have inspired, gone. The man called Saito spoke with quiet urgency. Hijikata nodded. The man who'd called himself Okita grabbed hold of her wrist, gave her a smile, and began to lead her down the street. His grip was a touch too tight to be friendly, his fingers like iron cables around her arm. There was no question about her situation. If she ran, she would die, quickly at least. But still, Even as she did as she was told, her life was in the hands of these strange men. She set her jaw and stood up as straight as she could. Her eyes met those of Saito as he looked up from the blood stained coat. His words were like a dagger in her stomach. What was going to happen to her? Was she. Going to die? As we walked through the cold Kyoto night, she felt horror began to crawl its way up her spine once again. The cause of her horror wasn't the gruesome end that almost, almost, ugh, that almost certainly awaited her, but something else entirely. I use they instead of we now. She'd spoken with these men and watched them speak to one another, not feet from a still warm corpse soaked in blood. That she had done such a thing terrified. Her in an altogether different way. Perhaps she thought, this is what it's like to go mad. And we'll leave it at that for the first part. And see you for the next part in the continuation of this story of the Shisengumi, of which I have meager knowledge. <laughs> rather, rather meager. Alright, so until next time, bye bye.